Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Lewis. I am a professor of special education here at the University of Missouri and one of four co-directors of the National OSEP Center uh, for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. This is one session in a series of webinars that our center has put together for school climate transformation grant recipients, both SEA and LEA. Uh, the topics that we present on are uh, generated through your request and your interest. Um, so you all at some point or your predecessor or someone uh, affiliated with the grant got a survey uh, and they were asked about different topics that was interest. And one of the topics that were interest uh, are classroom supports. So myself and my colleague, uh, Lisa Powers, who I'll have her introduce herself when um, she's up speaking, have put together a one hour session uh, to kind of talk about and highlight some of the key considerations. And what we'd like you to do is to think about this from a district-wide, school-wide perspective. So not thinking about individual classrooms, but how, is, how would we as a district support all classroom teachers? Or how within one school building, we would support all classroom teachers? So what we pulled together, uh, a little bit of information about effective practices, um, but we're going to spend the bulk of the time sort of walking through some of the systems that our partner and research site schools have been using over the past few years to try to in, to try to improve both the fidelity as well as fluency of those essential pieces. Um, as always, the slides will be available at pbis.org. This webinar will also be posted. Um, shortly after we finish recording this morning. Uh, it's a little, little daunting in that we're talking uh, to you and we hope you're out there. I see there's at least 50 of you out there. Um, if you have a question, uh, clarification, please put it in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to monitor uh, those as we go along. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, one of the things that I oftentimes talk about anytime I'm looking at challenging behavior, anytime I'm talking about building and improving both academic as well as social emotional behavior, I point out that, look, we can't make kids behave or learn, right? We know that on the academic side, we sometimes forget on the behavior side. We want to sort of what's the latest, greatest, so that we can, quote unquote, make these kids behave. But we point out, look, we can't make them. The good news is, as educators, we can create environments to increase the likelihood students learn and create environments to increase the likelihood students, quote unquote, behave. And what we know from um, decades of research now, environments increase the likelihood are guided by a core curriculum and influence consistency and fidelity. Now, once again, on the academic side, we typically get that. When I talk to teachers, I talk to a second grade teacher and I say, you've got a little one struggling to learn to read. What would you do? Get more practice. What if that doesn't work? Ask colleagues for ideas. What if that doesn't work? Talk to our literacy specialist. What if that doesn't work? Talk to my special education colleagues. Maybe this little one has a learning stability. In other words, what teachers routinely tell us is they would put more and more supports in the environment to increase the likelihood kids learn to read. On the behavior side, it's the same. Think about what supports can we put in the environment to increase the likelihood kids learn, increase the likelihood kids uh, become fluent in social, emotional, behavioral skills. So we want you to think about behavioral challenges that you see in your schools the same way uh, in looking at academic challenges. What else can we put our in, in our environment to increase the likelihood? Now, a couple of key features uh, that we regularly always loop back to and remind folks. Um, we're going to talk about MTSS, SCOID PBS, SCOID PBIS, RTI, whatever it is you want to call it, right? It doesn't matter what four-letter or three-letter acronym you use. What we want you to think about is that building MTSS systems requires this problem-solving framework. We always start with data. And we're going to talk a little bit this, uh, today about using data and looking at our classroom supports. We then carefully match the practices to the data. 
In other words, what most people want to do is just grab the best practice. What's the latest, greatest? And we always say, well, we need to find, figure out what's going on in your school, in your district. There are some commonalities across schools that we work with, but then there are also unique pieces. In addition, if we're going to ask all of our teaching staff and other staff in our school or district to implement best practice, we want to make sure we're carefully progress monitoring. Make sure the data indicate that behavior learning is moving in the direction we want. And then finally, the last piece, and what we really want to underscore and emphasize uh, in this webinar, how do we support each other? How do we support the staff that we're asking to implement best practices? You know, one of the things that we hear often um, when we, particularly when we talk about classroom, we'll go through and Lisa will kind of walk you through some of those essential features and teachers will nod their head. Oh yeah, I do that. Oh, I've been doing that for years. Oh yeah, yeah I do that. And we agree. You probably do do that, but what you might not be doing is putting it in with intensity to match the intensity of the learning challenges among your students. So in other words, we also need to keep this sort of continuum and differentiation in mind. So you've all seen the triangle and or the pyramid and variations. I sort of like these two shots and that we kind of have the traditional sort of logic of moving from universal tier one up into tier two and tier three. The other picture I think is equally important. Regardless of where we are in putting supports in place, universals are always in the background. We talk about you're only going to be successful with your intensive and targeted or tier two and tier three uh, interventions to the degree that you've got good, solid universals. And within those good, solid universals, classrooms are key. Our colleague, friend Kent McIntosh, has done a lot of research looking at why schools maintain, why schools sustain um, over time. And there are several key factors, one of which is that schools have paid attention to supporting classrooms. Um, so, yes, there's a question about is there a link? There's not a link yet. All of this will be posted at pbis.org. If you go specifically to the School Climate Transformation Grant section, you will be able to access this webinar as well as the PowerPoint slides. So thinking about universals, right, we start with what do you want kids to do instead? And that equally applies to the classroom. Stop thinking about decreasing problem behavior, challenging behavior, but rather improving social, emotional, behavioral responding, just like we want to make sure we improve and keep kids moving academically. We teach and practice, teach and practice, teach and practice. Uh, we've got to give positive, specific feedback. And that's that's one of those essential strategies that we'll talk about in a second. We're even going to apply the logic of positive behavior supports to responding to problem behavior. Meaning, yes, it's okay to point out when kids make errors. It's okay to put corrections in place. It's okay that if a kid has disrupted instruction to the point where it stopped or kids have become physical or aggressive, there should be a response. But we're gonna encourage you to also think about how do we teach the child, teach the student what to do instead. Always, always, always using data along the way. Um, and we're going to keep our families aware and involved. We always recommend schools and districts get their quote unquote house in order first um, and then reach out and connect and share information with families, share information with community. So I'm going to turn over um, the next section to my colleague, Lisa. Uh, she'll introduce herself and go from there. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. My name is Lisa Powers. I'm part of the MU Center for Schoolwide PBS. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a long, long, long uh, special education teacher, a PBS coach, and an administrator. <clears throat> um, so I have been watching PBS uh, evolve across the last 20, 25 years or more, and um, <clears throat> have come to appreciate the importance of ensuring the essential 
practices are in each and every classroom across a school. And so when Tim talked about how do you look at these eight effective classroom practice or essential practices that we'll talk about today, the question really is how do we ensure in our district and or school that these things are in every single classroom? So we'll We'll start with defining and describing each one of those so we have a common language in which we understand these practices together. A pre-correct, you may know each of these from a different name, either in your pre-service training or in professional development. Um, but like uh, Dr. Lewis said, many of these you are um, super familiar with. And so whatever you call it, we just want to make sure we're describing and defining the features of them the same. For example, um, opportunities to respond. Some schools and districts call that um, <clears throat> active engagement. In a few minutes, we'll describe and define what those look like. So we'll go over each one of these eight effective practices um, in a few moments. Um, one thing that uh, Dr. McIntosh is helpful in reminding us is we really want to think about if your school does a great job of PBIS in common areas, but it's not happening in classroom, then your students are really not going to a PBS school. The good news is if you are doing PBS in those common areas, when we go through these eight essential practices, you will see that it is linked and similar. It's um, just matched to the context of the classroom. So the first one we're gonna talk about really quickly is um, ensuring you have classroom expectations in every classroom. Much like, and this is where you can see the link, much like in uh, school-wide expectations are clearly uh, defined and posted and taught, we wanna make sure that the same thing is happening in the classroom. So this is an example of a sixth grade center here in the St. Louis area. And they identify classroom practices as one group across the school and have committed to teaching these. And I know it's a little difficult to see, but you can see things like in each and every classroom, they're gonna ensure uh, students have all the materials they need to be successful. They're going to, um, and because of where we are now, they're gonna ensure they're wearing a mask. They're going to listen to others respectfully. And so what might be slightly different is how, how, what materials you need for each and every class, but that they are all teaching um, how to be prepared for class. So in alignment to what happens school-wide, you want a few, um, you want to use the school-wide expectations in your classroom, and you want to define those behaviors match to the classroom. Some schools or districts will say teachers can create their own behaviors for the classroom, but they're always all linked to the school-wide expectations because we want to create a common community. We post these in our classroom so that we can use them and refer to them frequently. We teach them uh, as intensely as we need so that children are successful. And then we recognize students when they follow these expectations. The next one is really where you can uh, differentiate a little bit for each classroom, ensuring that we've really thought through all the procedures or routines that are needed for each classroom, and we break them down into the steps. And the steps could be three steps to eight steps, depending on the actual activity or task or routine you're teaching and what your students need to know to be successful with that routine. So for this example, in this particular classroom, this is how they're prepared for class. They In this classroom, they're going to need their pencil, their notebook, their textbook, their folder, and a personal reading book. They listed everything so that children are setting, they're setting their children up for success for that class. And they're putting them in places where children can have that visual cue or reminder so that a teacher isn't needing to correct or prompt a bunch. It's, it is that that visual is helpful for all of us to be on the same page. Teachers also want to teach these uh, routines routinely and then acknowledge students, thank students, thank students for having their materials and supplies and being ready for class. The next. The 
The next um, <clears throat> example talks about different routines that you might want to consider. So when you're thinking across a district or school, it may be helpful to remind teachers, these are some common routines that you want to have in classrooms. There are many, many, many routines that we do in a day as a teacher. Sometimes um, thinking about what are I, what am I most regularly correcting and thinking about, do I need to have a routine for that and or reteach that. So just like your school-wide expectations, you're clearly going to define these routines. You're going to ensure that they're taught to students consistently used. So teachers are monitoring them and then recognizing students when they're successful for those routines. And here are just some to think about. Um, how do you enter a classroom? Uh, how do you get the teacher's attention? Even how do you get your teacher's attention when there are different activities within the classroom? What do you do if you're absent? What do I do when I'm finished work? Again, Again, like Dr. Lewis said when we started, how do you think about these things so that you set them up for success versus having to correct these behaviors? Much like your school-wide uh, school systems, you also uh, in the classroom are ensuring that we're encouraging expected behavior as well. So going back to your routines and expectations and that we're <clears throat> have defined and taught, we want to be sort of these roaming reinforcers in a classroom. When students are engaging in the expectations, we want to acknowledge them and we want it to be meaningful and authentic. Um, if we're having a lot of shouting out in the classroom, here's an example of a teacher who has um, <clears throat> reminded and taught in this particular um, when I'm teaching a lesson, we need to remember to raise our hands. So she has Thanks, Shamara. Thank you for being responsible and raising your hand to speak. So she's using the school-wide language and, in sh and linking it to the behaviors of the students. Just like in uh, across the school and cafeteria and um, uh, hallways, we want it to be four to one. Um, and if your school uses a school-wide ticket system, it, it isn't a uh, uh, it isn't that you have to, but if they are, we really want teachers to integrate that into their classroom. So use the school-wide system in your classroom versus creating another whole different system. Link it to what's there. It makes it easy for you. But the big picture is students are getting verbal specific feedback around meeting the expectations at a high rate. And this is the last of the four that are clearly aligned to the school-wide piece um, and essential classroom practices discouraging inappropriate behavior. This is where if you have a in your across your school, a flow chart for responding to unwanted behavior, this then can how do I apply it in my classroom in um, how do I think of unwanted behavior as an opportunity to reteach or to prompt and cue. So we want to ensure when we're giving uh, feedback to students, we can do it in a professional, respectful way and that they can see it as a learning opportunity. I'm supporting you by teaching you what you should be doing um, and going to prompt you right before you um, need to use that skill again in the classroom. Some other things, and if we experience unwanted behavior, we can have um, ensure we're maybe walking, uh, using proximity, walking over to the environment where that problem behavior might typically happen so that we can actively supervise that. We could um, praise students. We could ignore the behavior um, and then teach it at another time. We can redirect, provide opportunities for choice and student conferences. Um, take a little bit longer in teacher's time, but our options as well. Active supervision in the classroom is another essential practice in that we want to be present and have with itness within our classroom. We want to move, scan, and, inter and interact. We, this is an opportunity in which we can think of ourselves as um, uh, so think of this as an opportunity to build relationships with students. 
Uh, we can reinforce the behaviors we've taught, but we can also just have an opportunity to talk with them, non-contingent attention uh, during times when we're supervising. We have a presence in the classroom in which children know that they're supported and that they're seen. So this move, scan, interact um, is uh essential for ensuring the safety and connection with children in the classroom. When you start thinking about these next three, just real briefly, we really are linking academics and behavior or instruction and behavior. How do we set up an environment in which children are engaging in instruction in a high in high frequency so that we can prevent problem behavior or downtime. So how do we develop lessons that have a great number of opportunities to respond and respond in multiple ways? And there are some listed here, response cards, guided notes. We've seen over the last year and a half how technology has really helped us with this, with chat features or Quizlet, or there are many, many options in which we can um, set up systems in which children can engage on a more frequent basis. The more engaged children are in learning, then the less likely we're to see unwanted behavior. And then these last two are, are similar, and um, I should have given a pre-correct when we started. We're just giving a brief overview to describe and define what these look like. There are, um, we could do a whole hour on each one of these. But here you're again thinking about instruction and the sequencing of that instruction. So how, how are the lessons set up? And I know, we know right now teachers are under a great deal of pressure to ensure academics that our children are put in air quotes caught up. Um, and at some point we're seeing in classrooms that they're engaging in long, intensive tasks. How do you break that up so that it is uh, easy, shorter tasks with longer, more intensive tasks followed by shorter tasks so that um, it provides some, some relief and stress for some of those harder tasks so that we don't get behavior because tasks are too hard. That's sort of it in a nutshell. And then how do you provide choice, different ways in which children can demonstrate their understanding by using whatever their strengths are. So maybe I can share what I learned by creating something in um, on the computer and or uh, sharing it with you in a, a speech or um, I'm writing a paper on something. So what are the different ways in which I can communicate what I like, what I learned, and can we provide choices for things like that? And even choices in how I learn. Can I um, learn with a partner or do I need to try this by myself? Or can I learn by reading or do I need to um, work in a group? So there are many different ways in which we can provide choice in this um, in the instructional piece. And then the last one, is around task difficulty. Um, how do we think about when we're asking children to do specifically independent work that they actually can do it independently? Um, we're seeing a lot of schools now doing more safe practice or supported practice so that um, children don't get frustrated. And, and then if they're doing um, activities that are um, above their level, then we can almost expect unwanted behavior because it is difficult to do things I'm not fluent at. So when schools and districts are considering these practices, how does this become a topic or standard um, conversation in grade level team meetings or at the school level? And teachers are already doing this. How do we think about this in relationship to when are we experiencing problem behavior and then asking the question, have we considered our task difficulty when we're, um, and those two things linking together. And then lastly, um, Dr. Lewis and I just wanna highlight um, each one of the eight effective classroom practices, we can do a whole hour to a whole day on. We just did five minutes across. So we just gave you the high level view. But if you want more information, the Missouri Schoolwide PBS website has each one of these eight effective classroom practices, um, materials, there are uh, videos, 
and presentations that go into each one of them in detail. There are checklists and check sheets um, and um, examples. So we want you to know those resources are there should your district or school decide we want to prioritize all or some of these practices across each and every classroom. So thank you, Lisa. Um, another question again, all of this material will be posted after the seminar. Uh, that is completely um, our apologies for not getting it in sooner. Um, Lisa and I tend to tinker up to the minute before we launch. So what I asked Lisa to do was kind of walk through those essential features and kind of just give us some quick operational definitions so that we're all sort of on the same page and thinking about what these things mean. The larger challenge is how do we put these in place? How, um, how do we build systems across our district and or within our school? Um, the question again is that they'll all be on PBIS.org under this school climate transformation grant session section. So what I want to talk about in the next uh, 25 minutes or so is how we build those systems. And I want to share some examples from districts and schools that we're working with similar to yours. Um, when we think about supporting teachers, when we think about classroom systems, I want you to kind of think about four key pieces. The first is at the district level, right? So from superintendent on down, we set clear expectations that all of us will strive to get better, to improve, to maintain those effective instructional strategies and practices, right? So it's it's mentioned, it's within our top priorities in terms of what we're implementing. We then wanna talk a little bit about how we ensure we're all on the same page, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we've moved away from these very long workshops to these very brief 10, 15 minute mini kind of professional development. And then the last two pieces that we'll talk about, just like students, if we don't get feedback on our own skills and behavior, it's really hard to maintain. Um, as I said, we've heard teachers say, oh, I do that, I do that. And, and we agree, you probably are doing it, but you might not be doing it with the intensity to match the challenges of the students you work with. Now, I say that a lot and people will say, well, what do you mean, Tim? What do you mean by the intensity? Right? The intensity is just simply increasing the potential frequency of using these strategies. I'll give you an example. There's a wonderful text by Betty Hart and Todd Risley called Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Lives of Young American Children, or, or some variation of that. Betty Hart and Todd Risley were researchers uh, out of Kansas, and they were interested in early language experience and then later life outcomes. They were also interested in, in kind of the intersection between language, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. So they went into homes of uh, professional, working class, poor. They went into um, white homes and African-American homes. And as I said, they just simply watched primary caregiver interact with these young ones. So we're talking, you know, year and a half, two years, when kids are, are really kind of getting a grasp and understanding language usage. And then they followed these kids into adulthood. Well, Surprise, surprise, has nothing to do with the color of your skin, but a whole lot to do with how much money's in that home. We know that poverty is such a huge risk variable because poverty is linked to substance abuse, poverty is linked to nutrition, poverty is linked to access to healthcare, poverty is linked to access to educational opportunities, and so on. The really cool thing they did in this book is they projected out what it would take to catch kids growing up in poverty to get them ready for school at K, right? So we talked about one of those things was that positive specific feedback. Uh, and Lisa talked about kind of that four to one ratio. Sure, it's okay to correct kids, but we wanna make sure most of our attention, most of our feedback is given to do the correct thing. So they estimate by time a child is three years old, <laughs> to get them caught up with what a typical working class child has experienced by the time they set foot in kindergarten, right? So let's say we get them for two years and we wanna to try to catch them up with that language experience. They estimate it will take 1,100 instances of affirmative feedback per day to get that kid caught up. 
to what a working class child's experienced, right? They went into these homes and professional homes, kids heard up to 30 affirmative statements per hour. I'm proud of you. That's great. I knew you could do it. Fantastic. Kids in poverty heard about nine, right? So that's what I mean by intensity. If you're dealing with kids, high risk environments, if you're dealing with kids coming out of poverty, they have not had that same early learning experience that your middle class or your upper middle class children have. They haven't had the richness of the language. They haven't had the history of getting that positive feedback. Back when, you know, it'd be fantastic again to, to do this in person. But when I talk to teachers, you know, I ask them, have you ever tried to give these kids a compliment? And they, they were coil. They don't have a learning history with the richness of language, with the richness of feedback we give them. That's what I mean by intensity, right? We're going to have to ramp up, right? We can't get away with four to one. We need to look at 12 to one, 15 to one, uh, and so forth. So, so that's what I mean by, by increasing the intensity. So thinking from a district perspective, thinking from an individual school perspective, remember I told you our problem solving, we always start with data. So what we do is we have teachers self-assess. We have them self-assess anonymously. And there are several of these tools available in pbis.org, as well as our Missouri, uh, pbismissouri.org under the classroom section. So we have them self-assess anonymously. And what we do as a school is we look for common areas that all of our teachers are saying, yeah, I struggle a bit with this, right? So we can do a self-assessment. Um, we've had schools go in and actually benchmark their um, school. Now, once again, we go and we collect data. It's all anonymous, right? We aggregate it. So we say, as a school, here's where we are uh, in terms of our opportunities to respond. As a school, here's where we are in terms of our positive to corrective feedback. As a school, here's where we are in terms of fluency with routines and procedures. The other thing that one of our schools developed, and I thought it was just pure, pure, pure brilliance, we can't take credit for this, is they gave a quiz to the kids. If teachers said, yep, I got clear routines, yep, I got procedures, yep, I gave high rates of positive feedback, then the kids should be able to reflect upon that. Um, and so this is a real nice little quiz, like when the teacher blank, most students stop and listen, right? So when the teacher gives that attention signal and the kids themselves indicate yes, no, right? Um, Lisa, hopefully if you're monitoring the chat, that would be great in the Q&A as we go along. Now, if you want to know sort of where we get to kind of some of these numbers, um, there hasn't been much in the, the, the literature for a long time. Our good friend and colleague, Terry Scott, along with his colleagues at, at Louisville, basically aggregated thousands and thousands of classroom observations, both they've conducted uh, as well as some colleagues uh, around the country. Uh, and this little book here is a great resource because what they say is, look, at a typical elementary, here are the rates and here are the rates that are linked to in increases in academic performance as well as uh, increases and in improvements in social emotional behavior. Um, so a lot of these numbers that we get, we rely heavily on, on this book that, that Terry and colleagues put together. So, as I said, we set a clear expectation. We start with data. We benchmark our school. The next is we need to make sure everybody's on the same page. So, the, the slides that Lisa walked through and looking at how we operationally define these are actually pulled from our website, pbismissouri.org. What we've done is we've gotten away from these hour-long workshops. We've gotten away from these day-long workshops, right? And, and you taught us this. Years ago, I interviewed all of the teachers in several of our research schools, and I said, how can we support you in terms of classroom practices? And the response was, well, I need it when I need it, <laughs> meaning I don't want to go to a workshop before school starts, right? I want to basically try what I know, and when uh, I run into challenges, that's when I need help in terms of some of my instructional or classroom management skills. So what we've done is we've adopted this sort of district-wide, school-wide logic, and you can get all of these materials, again, at pbismissouri.org. Simply look at classroom practices. So what we've done is produce what we call these mini modules. And for each of those eight essentials that Lisa quickly walked through, we have a mini module. 
So what's a mini module? A mini module is a 10 minute, 15 minute in service that we do to a faculty meeting, right? Remember we've benchmarked our school, we've self-assessed and everybody says, yeah, we probably could do a little better on procedures and routines. It's really important that you do this as a school or a district, not say, well, these teachers are doing great. Let's just focus on these two. No, we want to build that collegiality. We want to build that culture of trust. We want to build that school-wide um, kind of movement, if you will. We do everything else as a school around our universals. Classrooms should be part of it. So these are literally slides from the mini module. There are videos. There are examples. Um, there are quick little activities, right? So what they are, quickly defined. We always have a discussion point to engage our staff, even though it's only 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, we then do an activity and get folks primed, if you will, and set up. Now, one of the challenges that happened during the pandemic is we no longer have even 15 minutes for professional learning. Uh, this year in particular has been probably one of the most challenging years I have seen in education in, in my 30 plus career. Um, just the critical staff shortages with so many people out. And, you know, it was always tough to get subs to do professional learning. Forget that, right? <laughs> There's just not enough bodies out there. So the other thing we've done, again, you can go to pbsmissouri.org as we've created these virtual modules now. So you as a district, you as a school could say, okay, let's prioritize. Let's do a self-assessment. Now all teachers go and do these, these virtual modules um, that are online and I'll kind of walk you through them. Here's the next critical step, right? And the next critical step is we as a school are focusing on one uh, strategy. So let's say it's that four to one. Let's say it's opportunities to respond. We're going to focus just on that one skill for the next quarter, the next semester, in some cases, the entire school year, right? What we want to do is we want to make sure that we're building fluency among all of our teaching staff. And I should have pre-corrected as well. Do not misunderstand me. I am not bashing teachers and I'm not saying we should put all of this on their plates. Absolutely not. I point out all the time, if, if we've got teachers struggling uh, with some challenging learning or academic or behavioral issues in the classroom, that's a school issue. That's a district issue. That's an individual teacher issue. Um, this is about, again, building that collegiality, building that support making it okay for a teacher to say, hey, I'm struggling with this group of kids. Can someone please come in and help? But we wanna make sure that help is systemic uh, and we wanna make sure that help is benefiting all, right? Now, one of the things that we know, what we're doing right now, <laughs> this, our webinar is a non-example of effective instruction. We're talking at you, we're not giving you opportunities to practice, uh, and we don't have follow-up built in. We know it violates what we're telling you to do in your schools and districts. The purpose of these is to get kind of lots of information in a quick sort of short soundbite. Um, and then as always, there'll be follow-up. There's lots of resources and, and, and we're going to point you to several of those to help you put this in place. So if you retain per the research from Joyce and Showers, 10% or 5% of what we've said today, it's been a good, a good day, right? But look at what happens when you give practice opportunities and you give specific feedback. It goes up to skill mastery around the 95%, right? Just like kids, we need feedback. We need feedback as adults. So the other critical piece, start with data, identify a skill, do a brief professional development, 10, 15 minutes, or everyone does it virtually. Here's the critical piece. You have to build within your system feedback for teachers, right? And we've done a lot of different studies and we're, we continue to do a lot of research in classrooms, looking at different strategies such as peer coaching. So Lisa and I get along okay. I find 10 minutes, I can go watch her teach. And the skill we're focusing on is opportunities to respond. So I just go in, I sit in the back of the room and I just count the number of opportunities to respond I see Lisa give. I leave that piece of paper on her desk and I go away. 
We don't meet. I don't create a plan. She sees the number. She knows the benchmark. Ooh, I'm a little low. She's got that one page from the mini module of different strategies to put in opportunities to respond. And she's like, well, maybe I'll try the dry erase boards. Maybe, maybe that will work in this classroom. And she finds 10 minutes to watch me and does the exact same thing, right? We don't create hours of planning. We're just collecting data and sharing it. Um, principles, you're supposed to do walkthroughs. You typically enter the room and immediately everybody's like, okay, who's in trouble, right? Who is who is he or she coming to get? Um, we've had principals who do during their walkthrough also collecting data on the skill. And that little app that you see there, you can get this at the app store, both Apple and Android, um, is, is allowed our principals to do their walkthroughs. Let's again say we're doing opportunities respond. They come in, tap, tap, tap. They hit send and it's emailed directly to the teacher. Now, once again, a couple things to consider and keep in mind. One, the teacher is the only one who owns the data, right? The exception is if we're benchmarking as a school, but we then de-identify the data. This is not part of the evaluation. This is not part of plans of assistance. This is us making sure we're implementing universal classroom strategies and practices with high fidelity. So make sure you create all those rules. And, and unfortunately, we've, we've seen some non-examples. Um, years ago, I remember a high school came up during a conference and they were all worked up, said, hey, we're doing this. It's working really well. But the principal is putting the art teacher on a plan of assistance because she didn't hit the four to one ratio. And the art teacher was there. It's like, I've never sent a kid to the office. I don't have any problem behavior. Um, and again, that's a great example of that context is, is pretty reinforcing to most kids sitting in our class, creating and so forth. She doesn't need to give that high rate, right? So the other thing to keep in mind is across environments, there is some variation and that's okay. The critical piece is we're putting these in place we're seeing improved outcomes, both learning academic as well as learning around social, emotional, behavioral. That's the key. It's not about, okay, 90% of our teachers are hitting this benchmark. It's those kid outcomes, right? Kid outcomes are the critical piece. So I want to walk you through a couple examples. Uh, and these are both school examples. Uh, but once again, kind of with district support and resources to help this, um, the app was the SCOA, S-C-O-A, uh, stands for Student Classroom Observation and Analysis. Um, so here's an elementary school. They were implementing Tier 1 with high fidelity. They had 90% on their TFI. Uh, and they said, okay, we're ready for Tier 2. We're ready for Tier 2. And the principal said, hold on. This was the end of the school year. Here's our data. Right. We had one thousand seven hundred and twelve referrals that required me to get involved. If you think about that range across the continuum, you'd expect 80 percent of zero one, about 15 percent, two to five and about five percent with six or more. They had 57 kids with nine or more referrals. They can't put enough tier two, tier three supports in place. It would kill them, right? It would be a Herculean effort. These data are a great example of we've got to increase the intensity of our universals, right? Because if our intensity of the universal is matching our kid need, we'd expect these numbers to decrease. So what they did is they self-assessed uh, and they basically found that during the literacy block was the most challenging for these teachers. They used to have a bunch of instructional assistants, budget cuts, all of that was gone. Um, so the teachers were basically trying to differentiate instruction. So I'm at my little U table with a group of four. Some kids are over here doing independent. And then other groups of kids are trying to do some peer learning. Basically, what I'm doing is looking up and yelling at everybody because nobody's on task and, and nobody's learning. Right. So they basically went through routines and procedures. They taught kids practice how to get help if you need my help. And I've got a small group that I'm engaged. They really focused on those procedures and routines. Lots of pre-corrects to kids beforehand. Every now and then, even though I got my small group, they're doing some silent reading. I'm looking up and I'm giving feedback to the rest of the class. So that's what they focused on. That's what they worked on for an entire school year. And here's what happened. Down from 1,700 to 516, their numbers now are more aligned. Now they've only got 16 kids that need those truly intensive supports. 16 is much more manageable than 57, 
right? So this is an example of what we mean by building system-wide classroom supports. Another school, small rural school, had very little supports. They decided to do a universal screener and found about a third of their kids were popping at, the, at risk or high risk, right? And they said, okay, what do we do? It's like, okay, first of all, what you've got to do is to make sure you're implementing good classroom supports at high fidelity. And what they did is they benchmarked their school and they decided they were going to focus on that encouraging expected behavior, that four to one. So their initial benchmark for every corrective statement, they gave about 1.85 positive, right? And they knew the optimal was much, much higher. So they did kind of the traditional um, January, they did some staff development about positive specific feedback. Um, and then they did some follow-up and found it moved from about 1.85 to 2.44. So just simply doing the PD without the supports led to very little change. So they did some follow-up mini modules, and then they added some peer coaching. They added that performance feedback. At the end of the year, they were at 6.55 to 1. Right, so here's a school that spent an entire school year focusing on one skill. It's a great skill because it builds fluency, it builds rapport, it changes the climate and tone of our school and our classrooms. So what happened? What happened was ODRs, their majors decreased by 40%, minors by 35%, and in particular, classroom minors by a third. So this is what we mean when we think about putting in those essential practices that Lisa walked through, but building the systems, data practice systems. The practices are well known and the practices will be very familiar and fluent to pretty much all of our teaching staff. It's building those systems so that we can help them match the intensity of implementation. Now, we know that when we get to the high school, We've got some unique challenges when we talk about classrooms. First of all, we've got a wide range of delivery. We have lecture halls, we have labs, we have studios, um, we have, you know, sort of vocational arts and everything in between. So it's a little bit more challenging to embed these practices uh, within to support high risk kids, right? And the other thing is in high schools, we have unfortunately created very elegant systems to get rid of kids. We've de-incentivized teachers to, to change their practice. This kid's disruptive, kid's not following directions. I got a four, my tick boxes, and I've got a platoon of five assistant principals down there who deal nothing but with challenging behavior. We've got to incentivize teachers to, to change what they're doing. And once again, I'm not bashing teachers. I'm not blaming teachers. 99.9% .9 of teachers I interact with say, yes, I would like to get better. I would like to learn more. I just don't know how to do it, right? We build those district-wide expectations and district-wide supports, school-wide supports. We see teachers really blossom. So one of the things that is unique at high school is it's all about the credit. And the state tells you very explicitly what you have to have in place for that student to get that credit to graduate. And so there's less wiggle room, if you will. Right. So years ago, uh, colleagues and I had a, a big grant that we looked at high school supports for kids with disabilities and those incredibly high risk. Um, and we created lots of different strategies and practices, one of which was accommodations. Right. And so we put together this accommodation guide. Once again, you'll get these slides. You'll have the URL link to, to get this, uh, this guide and download it. But basically, it follows, once again, kind of the logic of what we do in MTSS PBIS. So it's a series of steps and decisions and tick boxes. So these meetings take 10 minutes, right? Just like the, the, the mini module PD, we tried to create um, kind of this sort of guided strategy. So accommodations are especially appropriate at high school because we're, we're not changing instruction, right? We can't. The state tells us exactly what kids need to do to get that credit. What it does is it builds in supports to allow kids to be successful. So I want to share, again, kind of just an outcome. This is a case study. We had a 10th grade student on an IEP um, reading at about a third grade level. This uh, student was an IEP for uh, emotional behavior disorder as well as learning disability. Um, and the class where he was really struggling was this general education co-taught History. It was English and history together. This high school did these block schedules of 90 minutes. 
The other critical piece that we build into all of our supports within the classroom is teacher choice. And if teachers say that won't work in my classroom, we say, okay, how about this? Yeah, that that could work, right? Again, it's kind of respecting that wide variation among how we deliver instruction in high school. So we put the accommodation guide in place. Uh, we put some real simple um, things in place, like the kid could move himself if he got distracted. The kid kept all of his materials in the classroom. So when he showed up and didn't have his book, didn't have his paper, didn't have his pen, he didn't have to go back to the locker and try to chase them down. They were there. And the teacher selected one of the classroom strategies about increasing their feedback to this young man. And they acknowledged that, yeah, he can be pretty challenging and, and they probably focus more on his problem behavior than appropriate behavior. So what happened? Here's what happened. Within the matter of about six school weeks, we went from 24% in his grade to 77%. So this kid is now passing, right? And he even said, this is the highest grade I've ever gotten since I started high school. So simple things we can put in place, but we're still following that data practice systems logic. This is more kind of thinking about maybe at a tier two. It's a little bit more individualized, but the guide and the standard process that we put in place across our school or schools, if we're thinking district, is standardized such that everybody understands the problem solving logic and what to do. Now, a couple of final thoughts when we think about classroom, right? Yes, we want to make sure we're implementing best practices. Yes, we want to make sure that we're putting practices in place that has strong research evidence. But there's also that intangible. Uh, and Lisa talked about kind of that with itness, right? That active supervision. Not just that we're there and we got eyes on them or we're going to pounce on them if they mess up, but we're aware of them and we're basically trying to connect to kids. So I also encourage all of my schools to think about what's the overall atmosphere. One of my litmus tests is when I come visit your school, how am I greeted when I walk in the office? I always follow protocol. I always go to the office first to sign in. Am I ignored uh, or kind of grunted at or it's, yep, it's early morning, it's bustling, but that, that, that staff member looks up, it's like, oh, welcome to our school, hang on a second, I'll be with you in a minute, right? How am I greeted when I go and hang out in your staff room? Um, how do people interact with each other, right? So thinking about your overall atmosphere, thinking about how you connect in your relationships. The study that I keep threatening to do, and I need to do it, is studying bullying behavior among teaching staff. It happens in every school I've ever visited, right? Kids are aware. They're constantly watching us. So yes, most of our MTSS work, most of our work in our school climate transformation grants are about kid behavior, but pay equal attention to how we interact with each other, um, how we interact with the kids. One of the things that gets my hackles up is I'll have educators talk about how disrespectful these students are. They're just horrible. They're so disrespectful. And then I watch them engage in incredibly disrespectful behavior with kids. I point out as, as educators, we always have to be the exemplar. And it's hard, uh, right? Kids can get under our skin. <laughs> it's hard, but we always try to strive to be that exemplar. And the last question I ask um, teachers to think about around school climate, is your school a place where you'd send your own child? And if you say, no, I wouldn't want my kid to attend my school, why? You can fix that. Yes, as educators, we can't do anything about the neighborhoods kids come from. We can't do anything about the fact that, that this young person might have been physically or sexually abused. We can't do anything about the fact that that mother uh, chose to ingest substances during pregnancy, right? I can't go back and undo that, but I can absolutely control my six hour school day. When that bell rings in the morning and the afternoon, that day is mine. That environment is mine. And I can put things in place to increase the likelihood kids learn, increase the likelihood kids are successful socially, emotionally, behaviorally. Now, I get it. I work in, in those schools where, yeah, we work really hard and we're doing great. And Friday bell rings and they come back Monday and it seems like they've forgotten everything we've taught them over the weekend. But we start again. So these grants that you all have, these school climate transformation grants are essential and key. School climate is an outcome. 
The outcome is when we build in effective strategies to increase the likelihood kids learn and increase the likelihood kids are socially, emotionally, behaviorally successful. When they're successful, you change your climate, you change the impact. In fact, some colleagues of ours in Utah conducted this study. They looked at 173 schools and found the key variable between high achievement was basically overall school environment, school tone, school climate. Uh, it outfactored parent support, teacher excellence, resources, money, and so on and so forth. So connecting with kids, creating that safe, supportive environment where they can thrive is key. Again, if you look at the mental health literature, they talk about risk factors and protective factors. One of the most powerful protective factors is the ability to read fluently by the end of third grade. In other words, if you can be successful and you can navigate that school environment and you connect to that environment, you're going to be more successful. When you look at why kids drop out, gather credits short and they're falling behind, but most of them report they got in that position because they didn't feel connected to their school. They didn't feel like they belong. They didn't feel like the adults in that environment cared whether they showed up, passed, or didn't pass. So school climate is an outcome, and the outcome is powerful in terms of the goals and objectives that we're all about in education. So a few more resources. Um, this is a great manual. And once again, it kind of follows the problem solving logic we've been talking about. There's a series of flow charts, sort of try this, that works, yay, celebrate. If not, uh, then you can try some, some of these more intensive pieces to put in place. Um, on our website, uh, pbs.org, you can download this multi-tiered system support in the classroom. It also uh, kind of lays out a lot of the key pieces that we've been talking about during this webinar. Um, there's another uh, similar uh, publication that focused specifically on with kids with disabilities. So if you are a special educator or you're a general educator and, and you've got children and youth uh, with disabilities in your classroom, I'd encourage you to check that one out as well. This is another resource that's available. Um, this is a free resource. There are those that cost that have more information. Uh, but if you simply go to highleveragepractice.org, you can download. Now, it says in special education, and there are some that are unique, things like around the IEP process and supporting parents and so forth. But all of the strategies in terms of academic and social are equally applicable for all kids, right? There's very little magic uh, to no magic in special education. It's just an intensification of good instruction, both academic and social emotional behavior. And then finally, uh, we've been talking a fair bit about uh, the different resources that we have on our state website, PBS, um, pbsmissouri.org. You see here is a, a, a screenshot of the website. If you go over to that profile that I've got circled, you can actually register for those virtual modules. There's no cost. Um, we just ask that you uh, put in your uh, email and, and, and create a password. Um, and we, we kind of track to see who's using it and then reach out about feedback and, and to continue to improve it. The mini modules and all of the materials that Lisa walked through under tier one, if you do the pull down and look at effective classroom practices, they are there. So we have about three minutes. Um, Lisa, is anything coming up in chat or the Q&A um, that, that we need to address or can maybe uh, chat about? I think most of them were related to where the resources are. So we started putting some links in. Oh, perfect. So Perfect. Yep. Right. Um, final thing, <laughs> we are, fingers crossed, going to be face to face. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but our annual forum will be this October. Uh, it will be in downtown Chicago, where it was last time we were uh, face to face. Um, there will be limitations on numbers because we still anticipate there'll be social distancing guidelines and so forth. So um, continue to monitor pbs.org. If you are a school climate transform transformation grant recipient, you'll be getting uh, additional information from project officers and your connections with the National Center uh, about the forum. Uh, but we encourage you, if you're going to attend this, to register 
as soon as registration is open. It usually opens up um, sometime this spring because I said, we, we unfortunately are going to have to cap it this year. Uh, and we'd hate for folks uh, to, to not be able to attend who, who really want to attend. So I'm going to end there. Um, thank you all very much. Thanks for the participants who showed up for live. Again, apologies. We didn't have all the slides set for you, but they will be posted uh, as soon as we hit end uh, the webinar. Um, it takes uh, the University of Oregon usually a, a couple days to process the video to get the video posted as well, but you'll be able to access that as well as the um, archive of past webinars. Um, so if this is something that you see value in sharing with some of your colleagues in your district or your school, um, that will be available as well. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you all very much for attending.